we're going to do that with opening prayer. You can stand up right here if you want. Yeah. <coughs> All right. How is everybody this evening? Good. Yeah, everybody looks good. Everybody looks uh, very sprightly and ready casual. for Casual. Casual. <laughs> yeah. Except Mr. Hendricks. Mr. Hendricks. He's got his tie on. Well, All right. Sands the ties. Sands the hair as well. Um, well, as, a, as appropriate, brethren, as the sun is uh, headed down, we are now transferring from the um, Feast of Tabernacles into the last great day, and essentially we have entered into a double Sabbath, if you will. Yeah, the last weekly. great day and the weekly Sabbath, and what a special double Sabbath it is. So we thought it would be appropriate that we'd have a Bible study as it leads us into the last great day. And as you would expect, there's no more appropriate way to start a Bible study than an opening prayer. So uh, again, from my Shreveport, if you come forward and... Uh, Ask the open prayer. Mighty Creator God, Father, we come to you, thanking you so much for all the wonderful blessings you give us. Thanking you, Father, that we were able to be together and celebrate your Sabbath, your Feast of Tabernacles, we had just closed, and and the the regular weekly Sabbath that's here, and the last great day, Father. Thank you so much for the blessing of understanding the knowledge that, that you have given to us to, to be examples to the world, to, to be able to know what we can do. And we ask, Father, that you will help us to always seek your will and do your will. We do ask now that you will open our minds to understand the things that we are about to learn, the, the studying that we're about to do. Help us to have open hearts and minds to receive what you teach us. We ask, Father, that your will be done in all things. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate it. Well, brother, we have something a little bit different. As you know, we announced early on in the week that uh, we would be fielding questions via the uh, means of uh, index cards. And we have quite a few that we'd like to address. But in addition to that as well, we have um, Bill who set something up on his uh, email. Oh, yeah, questions. yeah, yeah. Those of you on the internet, and by the way, welcome to uh, the Bible study here in Medina, Ohio. Uh, but I did want to make mention to those of you that are viewing us on the web, uh, that if you have questions, not that I don't know if we'll get to them tonight, but certainly in the future, we definitely, because we've got quite a handful already. Nevertheless, I uh, certainly don't want to discourage you from writing in, but uh, we've got a computer at my uh, email address, Bill. W, all small caps, or all small uh, case, Bill W at CGI.org. That'll forward right to my computer, and uh, we'll go ahead, and if we've got some time, certainly address those questions. So if any of you have on the internet questions, just go ahead and email us at Bill W, B-I-L-L-W, at CGI.org. Okay. All right, brethren, it certainly is an honor, uh, Wayne and Bill, to be sharing this platform with, with both of you. Um, right two, back at you. Yep, yeah, it's mutual. Yeah, yeah, two very good friends and colleagues I've known now since uh, the mid 1990s, 96, yeah. 98. So uh, yeah. it's a privilege to share this platform with you tonight. So um, with that, guys, I guess we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, we do have uh, several questions we want to get to, and as Bill alluded to, we may not have time to get to all of them, but in fact, we will do our best to uh, go through it as quick as we can. Each and every one of these questions that we have, I mean, honestly, you could take any subject in the Bible and you could literally make it a lifetime study. I mean, so we're just going to scratch the surface. So by no means uh, do we think it's going to be exhaustive. We'll do our best, but uh, we'll keep it as abbreviated and as, and as exhaustive as we most possibly can given the time and circumstances. Always keeping in mind that your minds can only <coughs> absorb right. what your butts can tolerate. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wanted to also take a minute, too, to express our appreciation for all of those uh, questions that you did contribute, because that's what makes the evening on this kind of a format uh, really interesting. Not that our answers would be all that breathtaking, but nevertheless, <laughs> <laughs> it does give us a little bit to grapple with. So uh, we should have a lot of fun tonight, and that's, that's the main thing. That's right. Sometimes we're not going to Captain Obvious, just stating the obvious, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, brother, shall we begin? Let's go to our first question. Let's go right out of the gate here. New Testament is generally accepted as written in Greek originally. Paul was a scholar, knew many languages. Some people suspect 
as origins of church essentially Jewish written in Hebrew first or simultaneously since Paul's letters were not direct, directed strictly at Greek assemblies, is it certain all in Greek wouldn't book of Hebrews be written in Hebrew to that group of believers? That's a very good question. Very good question. Yep. That's Roman answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Romans written in, say, Latin to the group of believers. Well, there has been some question over some of the... Uh, the different narratives that we find in the Bible. One of the, the most, I, I wouldn't say the most, but one of the, um, uh, the question group of um, scripture would be found in Matthew. Now, a lot of people think that Matthew was written in uh, Greek, and a lot of scholars have promoted that over the years, but it's more generally accepted now that, in fact, he did write it in Hebrew. Um, but remember, we're talking about a region in Jerusalem that was considered a decapolis, and there were many, many languages that were spoke back then. But generally speaking, the original believers in Christ were in fact Jewish, right? Mm -hmm. I think we'd agree yeah, on that. Absolutely. So Jewish would have been a- Or Hebrews. Or Hebrews. Some were Benjaminites and right. Levites. Hebrew speaking people. Right. Or Aramaic or Syriac, depending on whether or not they came from the Galilee. Yeah. yeah. But to Tony's point, and he's right, uh, Matthew was uh, originally, uh, uh, most scholars will to the fact it was written in Hebrew, and even in uh, the uh, history, church history uh, writer Eusebius uh, claims that he saw actual documents of uh, Hebrew uh, writings of the book of Matthew, as well as Origen and uh, Jerome and Papias, I think it is. Uh, these guys, these alleged church fathers who claim that they saw many of these uh, epistles uh, in, uh, written in Hebrew. And also, you gotta keep in mind as well, uh, there was an ingrown bias as well as prejudicial view uh, of uh, Greek uh, primarily uh, in some respects due to the Hellenistic influence into the Hebrew communities. Uh, so there was kind of a built-in bias uh, due to this negative, what some perceived to be negative uh, view and uh, impact into those um, uh, areas as well. So Hellenism was, though it was a major movement within that whole area, it wasn't viewed by all Hebrews as something that was um, welcomed, so to speak. So a lot of the uh, animosity and maybe even a little hostility toward toward the Greeks and, and so on was, uh, needless to say, quite obvious. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And, and to Tony's point about uh, that area there, <clears throat> Jerusalem uh, was occupied by the Romans and had been for a long time. And Hellenization, like Bill said, had been going on all the way back to the days of Alexander the Great. And, and so uh, it was really the crossroads, not only of the Middle East, but of much of the Roman Empire as well. And many people, probably a majority of the population, would have been at least conversant to some degree in two or three languages, and just in order to do business in that day and age. Paul uh, was brought up uh, in Tarsus, that's up in the Anatolian Peninsula, to that what we call today is Turkey, of course. And the predominant language of his youth up in that area was indeed Greek. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul alludes to the fact that he had all of the gifts. And I, I take that to mean the gifts of languages as well. And uh, the Lord Jesus himself, no doubt, would have used Latin, uh, Aramaic, uh, the Syriac version of that, which was uh, almost a, another language from, from uh, Hebrew, and, and of course Hebrew itself in the temple, which they would literally would have been required to speak Hebrew in the temple, and, but also the Latin influence was there because of uh, you know, the, the Roman soldiers. And, and so the Lord himself would have been naturally conversant in more than one language. So it's very likely also that once Paul wrote his epistles, and once he had been accepted by the brethren in Jerusalem and by the other Jews as being a bona fide uh, apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there was some question about him in the beginning. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and so whatever Paul may have written, certainly we can be assured that it would have been recopied in Aramaic and, and or Hebrew. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know. and, th and that's the sequence that they believe from the Hebrew to the Aramaic to the Greek. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Josephus also, just to add on uh, to what Wayne is talking about, Josephus, a second century historian, uh, also claims that he saw 
uh, Hebrew writings of uh, the uh, New Testament as well. But I think it goes to this point as, uh, in addition, and that is to recognize the fact that the oldest manuscripts we have are in Greek. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I'd like to just add what I've, I've said so many times. If you've heard me preach, you've probably heard me say, I believe that God directed the saving of the truth, preserving of the truth, in the richness of the, of the Greek language, irrespective of which was written first. It is Greek that we have now, and God is on his throne, and God has preserved the truth for us in the New Testament by virtue of the Greek that we translate now into English. We've got the truth, in other words. And, and to both my colleagues' points here, uh, it's also very important to, uh, to mention, no matter what language you're looking at, no matter what version of the Bible you're looking at, from the worst transliterations that you'll find, right? Um, in my humble opinion, I think the uh, New International Verse is probably one of the worst uh, translations in some aspects that you could come up with. However, I think it is good to mention, though, that no matter what the language that uh, the Bible has been transliterated in, just about 10 years ago I did a study on this, and within just a few years, way back then, the Bible was supposed to be translated or transliterated into virtually every known language on the earth. But here's my point. Regardless whether it's Hebrew, or whether it's Greek, or whether it's Syrian Aramaic, or whether it's English, whatever the case may be, uh, in God's infinite wisdom, every, each and every translation is good enough to bring us to the point of the knowledge of salvation. I, I believe that too. And if, if someone uh, has ears to hear, mm -hmm. and eyes to see, and they're looking, and they want to hear, yeah. and they're, leading, they're asking for the leading of God's spirit, uh, God responds to that. And uh, the truth can be obtained, uh, for instance, in the Douay Reims version of the Bible, which is the official Catholic Bible. Uh, it's, it's very much like the King James in the way that it reads, except that it, uh, it also accepts what they call the Apocrypha, yes. uh, which we reject because the Apocrypha is contrary to uh, the truths that we see in the, in the canon that we now have. As a matter of fact, the Apocrypha disagrees. Uh, the different books of the Apocrypha don't agree with each other, in fact. You know. But I believe the truth is there. And, and for those who want to know it and are humble enough to go after it and look for it and desire it, God certainly can lead you into the truth. Right. Yeah. And, and from what, uh, for validation purposes, in addition, do not discount the fact of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls because right. the Dead Sea Scrolls right now uh, are pretty much a validating uh, item as well for much of Old Testament primarily, but also yeah. a little bit of uh, other manuscripts too. So uh, that's interesting as well because they were so old themselves. That's right, and uh, what we have now that the King James Bible uh, comes from, uh, which has been the most successful translation, and from my perspective, I think I'd probably get agreement that God has done a very spectacular work because of the King James translation. And it has gone out all over the world. And uh, the King James translation comes from what we refer to as the Textus Receptus, which is not the oldest uh, manuscript that we have, but it, it is the one that, to get to uh, what Bill was talking about today with the mystery, the Mysterion of God, it is there in the Textus Receptus. It jumps off the pages at you from the Textus Receptus. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, those manu but the manuscripts that made that uh, up are old. Yes. And they took from that yes. and brought it forward. Yes. Yeah. The Textus Receptus yeah. is a third generation copy. Copy of a copy of a copy. Right. Yeah. And those, uh, the rules that the, the, the Greeks or the Hebrews would have used to copy those manuscripts were extremely strict. And uh, therefore, we can be reassured that the copies, because does anybody have, by the way, a copy of the original Hebrew text? Uh, no, I do not. No, I, and, and I don't know of anybody who studies antiquities or has I lost one years ago. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that when you lived next to Moses? Yeah. <laughs> 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 But, but the, uh, the way that they translated these or transliterated the text were, they were so strict that they would literally have, whether you were a, a Hebrew transcriber or a Greek, you would literally have somebody watching over your shoulder 
And the letters couldn't, they had so many different rules, the letters couldn't be more than a, the width of a human hair. Uh, you couldn't make a mistake. If the ink blotted, guess what? You were tearing up the whole manuscript and you were starting Start over from square one. Yeah. They That's were so meticulous mm -hmm. that during the process of making their copies, if an insect, for instance, yes, were to land on the paper, the entire thing had to be destroyed and you had to start over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It reminds me of a story. <laughs> <laughs> there was this age, ancient old scribe, and he was teaching a young man how to be a scribe. And he was teaching and writing and showing what Tony has just been talking about, how meticulous and detailed you have to be and then he said, excuse me, I have to go downstairs to the cellar. I'll be right back. Well, he disappeared. He never came back. Hour went by. Two hours went by. The young man is up there waiting for him to come back. He didn't come back. So he decides he's going down the cellar to see what happened to the old scribe. He goes down there, and there's the old scribe. Oh, 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 crying, <laughs> crying. He says, what's wrong? What's wrong? And he says, the word is celebrate, not celibate. <laughs> Just thought I'd share that with you. <laughs> maybe to take this uh, maybe a little step uh, further in this uh, discourse that we find ourselves in, but <coughs> the church can be reassured that the early church knew exactly what books they were canonizing. I mean, we have faith in uh, they knew what they were doing, and to be sure, as we go down through history, we have people like some of the people that Bill mentioned, Eusebius, we have Polycrates, we have Polycarp, we have Origen. Origen. Uh, the list goes on and on of people uh, post-Messianic uh, days that we have enough collection of their writings from their sermons. Right. You know, we can put and together- their witnesses too. And their and their witnesses too. Uh, there are enough quotes from their sermons, believe it or not, just in their sermons that we can literally recreate the entire New Testament except for 11 verses. That's right, yes. Another That's point that I just happened to think of, your, your words made me think of it, uh, the persecution of those who endeavored to translate uh, the Bible. It happens with the Textus Receptus. That's where Tyndale and Wyckoff and the others, that's where they ended up being so persecuted. There's a great being at large in the world who did not want those translations. Yeah. Yes. That's right. That's right. All right. All right. I think we, uh, I think hope we answered that question. Yeah. I think we got that one. <laughs> Do we answer that one? All right. All right, good. Moving on. Moving right <laughs> along here. But we could talk about the, the holy languages, but we'll skip that one. We'll leave that one alone. All right, brother. Here's the next question we have to entertain. It's uh, who are the people in the vision of the Valley, valley of Dry Bones? The saints? The second Ezekiel resurrection people, Ezekiel 37. The hip bones connected to the leg bone. <laughs> Ezekiel 37. That's where that song came from. Yeah. Is that right? Oh, yeah. sure. That yeah. was the underscore. Yeah. A little history, musical history. Sh shall I read this? Like, shall I read this at the complex? Yeah, go ahead. All right. The whole thing? Well, let's see here. Where should I start? Here we go. Let's just start in verse 11. How's that? Ezekiel 37. Well, uh, uh, allow me to, to uh, ask you to go on and read from the beginning all the way to verse 14. All right. Because it's, 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 it's all very informative about the yeah. whole event. I'll oh, sit, I'll sit there. Last day too. Yeah. 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 I'll sit there and think about that as I was saying that here. To verse 14, 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass by them around and behold there were very many in the open valley and indeed there were they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I prophesied as I was uh, commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and a sudden rattling, 
and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. And he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up from your graves, I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. So these are some very old bones, right? Very dry bones. Indicates yes, the, right. the, and the noisy. Yeah, noisy too. <laughs> Radley. Radley, you know. Takes me back to some of the uh, Warner Brothers cartoons. Right. You know? <laughs> And, it, and it's referred to as the whole house of Israel. And that's the that's, short answer. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the, the short answer. The entire answer. whole yeah. house of Israel. Yeah. Yeah. Scripturally supported. Yeah. But the longer answer and the extrapolation of this is that it's certainly applicable to take that out and in the extrapolation of the principle of this manifestation of physical beings coming back to life certainly right. can be applied in knowing other parts of the scriptures to others outside of the house of Israel. This specific is addressing the house of Israel. Yes. But that's not yeah. to dismiss the fact that this is not going to, that this is going to happen to others as well in the second resurrection where if you turn to Revelation just as a support scripture on this uh, to illustrate what I'm talking about in uh, chapter 20 and in verse four, I'll just break into the context. I saw thrones and they that sat upon them, judgment was given unto them. This is talking about the thousand year millennium that's mentioned in verse three. This is the kingdom of God. Christ lands on the Mount of Olives, the 1,000 years commences. And in verse four we see and we say, I saw thrones, they sat upon them, judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, the word of God, which had worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived, those that did not submit to the beast, those that were indeed God's children, they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Verse five, and the rest of the dead Hence, Ezekiel 37, the rest of the dead uh, did not, um, uh, again, live until the thousand years were finished. And then, of course, this is the first resurrection, talking about those that were re uh, resurrected in um, the coming of Jesus Christ. That second resurrection will be at the end of the millennium, as it says in verse 5. So understanding Ezekiel 37, we can make that connection to, uh, I suspect, something that you'll preach tomorrow. Uh, Not me. No? No? Who's preaching You're tomorrow? You're doing it now. Look. <laughs> right there. What, here? Tomorrow? Tomorrow, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but 11 a.m. 11 a.m. It does <laughs> indeed tie in episode. with yes. uh, the day of the Lord. It does indeed tie in with the day of the Lord. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, very very yeah. much so. Yeah. It, it is most definitely, I think, without any sort of disagreement whatsoever, it's definitely an end-time prophecy. Mm -hmm. well, let me share some words. I've got these uh, definitions here that I pinned in my Bible <clears> years ago in regards to this event here. And the word for breath, for instance, uh, I will cause breath to enter into you. The word is ruach, and it has a similar understanding as the word pneuma that we see in the New Testament, which can mean spirit, or wind, or breath, or, or the human thought process. It has many, uh, many meanings, but I will cause spirit, I will cause the spirit of life, in other words, to enter into you. And uh, that's highly significant. Down here in verse 9, it says, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, say to the Ruach, here it is, Ruach is the wind, says the Eternal, come from the four winds and breathe. And here the word breathe is nafak, and it literally means to inflate, to puff, to breathe in and out. So the imagery is, is clear. He's, he's causing flesh and sinew to come upon these bones. He's resurrecting these dry bones to newness of life and causing the breath of life to come into them and causing their lungs to 
inflate and deflate and be alive. That's what we're being told here. And that Hebrew is very illustrative of the fact that we're talking about physical beings, not spirit beings. We're talking about physical. Yes, indeed. Yeah. yeah. So. This, is, this is back to a physical resurrection. resurrection. It's the, the way that's portrayed, the language that is used here, you almost get the idea of watching the reverse decay process. Mm -hmm. Like, like the, everything's just coming, fitting right back yeah, onto the right. bones. It's yeah, very sure. amazing the descriptive yeah. language that is used here. Um, very amazing how, how uh, Ezekiel describes that as exactly. he is watching it unfold, as he's given these yeah, utterances vision. of yeah. prophecy. Yeah. And that's sometimes when we see prophecy, especially in John's case, you know, people are reporting the best that they can. Right. Try to describe what they're seeing going on. But can you imagine trying to describe something you've never seen? Before? Yeah, like helicopters looking yeah. like uh, locusts and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So putting together this and what Bill shared with us from the book of Revelation, the whole house of Israel and the rest of the dead, yeah. they're still going to live. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, yes. it's, and taking a little bit of license with this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it doesn't matter if you're your Hebrew in origin or what tribe of Israel from, but even if you're Gentile, you're all grafted in at the end anyways. That's right. As the Apostle Paul says here in uh, Romans chapter 11, if you would, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provide, uh, provoke you to jealousy who are in my flesh and save some of them, for if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world that will be their acceptance be but life from the dead. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is holy, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of those branches were broken off, and you being wild olive tree were grafted in among them, mm -hmm. so essentially, once we're resurrected, and ultimately the end time goal of being spirit beings, we're all part of ancient Israel. We're kind of in that grafted in process, right. no matter what your lineage is. And that goes back to what Paul was saying with uh, being spiritual Jews. You know, he, he talked about right. uh, through the circumcision mm -hmm. of faith, Yep. Whether we're Greeks, whether we're Scythians, whether we're Canaanites and Moabites, Edomites, yeah. doesn't matter. Faith, that circumcision yep. of faith in Christ, mm -hmm. uh, spiritually speaking, affords us to be children of Father Abraham. Right. To the point right. there, right. 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 You the can point. even elaborate on this and, and, and reflect on uh, some of you may remember in detail that <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate form wrestled with a man yeah. named right. Jacob. That's right. mm -hmm. And because of Jacob's tenacity, and his desire to have a blessing, uh, he would not let go. And the scripture says that they wrestled all night in, in the dirt. They, they would not, he would not let go. And as it began to dawn, the Lord God said, let me go. The, it's, the dawn is breaking. And he said, I will not let you go without the blessing. And short story. God was impressed by that. And he said, what's your name? And he said, your name is Jacob. You think God already knew that? Yes. <laughs> and he said, your name will not be Jacob anymore. From now on, it will be Israel, you know, because you have prevailed with me. And the word literally, when you break it down in all of its Hebrew components, it means a prince who prevails with man and with God. And and so there's a key understanding there that uh, connects with the, the preaching of America and Britain and prophecy. We are modern day Israel, and anyone who will embrace the God of Israel, by God's definition, the words that he spoke to Jacob, if you will prevail with the God of Israel, if you will embrace the God of Israel, and you will not let go, then from God's perspective and his definition, you are part of Israel. Yes. That's right. And a prevailer. And a prevailer, God. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And one who then achieves a degree of esteem in God's eyes. You know. Hence the word prince, which is actually contained in the word Israel. Yes. That's right. All right. All right. Next. Did, I, did I answer that question? All right, the next question, ironically enough, there has been no scripture that has been more speculated on than the next scripture I'm about to uh -oh. read. All right, the two go. witnesses. Oh, all right. Yeah. Now, in our culture, <laughs> in our culture, brethren, there has been so much speculation on who these two witnesses are. You go back during the days of Worldwide, some people thought it was Herbert and Dan Armstrong. Uh, I mean, there's any, there's a numerable, innumerable amount of possibilities of people who have tried to associate. Uh, personality-wise, to these two witnesses. Okay? Even, even latest one was 
was, uh, who, who was that gentleman and his wife? His wife was the second witness. Ron Wineland. What, Ron Wineland, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, he claimed that he was a, one of the two witnesses, and then later on, he, was he gonna realized name, yes, his, his wife, wife was, was one second. of the other witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess he was going to be that after he got out of jail for absconding with the church's <laughs> money. <Yeah. laughs> well, uh, certain. <laughs> Oops. Oops. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, yes. The question: Who are the two witnesses? Was that the question? Well, the question I was going to get to that. I oh. kind of jumped ahead. That's okay. <laughs> He's Russian. <laughs> <laughs> How can you prove, and I was kind of setting it up this way, how can you prove that the two witnesses are definitely angels? Well, short answer to that question is they're not angels. They're not short angels, answer, right. you can't prove that because yeah. that is not correct. Right, yeah. so yeah. you can't prove it. Yeah. That's the short answer. You cannot yeah. prove that they are angels because they're not angels. Yeah. I mean, we've spent so much time, uh, we, uh, euphemistically speaking here, in trying to identify who these two witnesses are that sometimes we miss the point. There's no doubt that when these two witnesses come on the scene that we're not, we're going to know who they are. Because they're not just two ordinary cast members, if you will. I mean, they have extraordinary powers, supernatural powers, but we need to be very clear about powers this. of Elijah. The powers of Elijah, the power of the spirit of Elijah, if you will. These two individuals get their power and authority from our creator, but they are physical. And I've already turned this, let's just read a little bit, this kind of set this up to prove, prove our, our point that they are, in fact, physical beings. And we find this in uh, Revelation uh, chapter 11. Now, with the two witnesses and the completion of these two witnesses, we finish up what's known as the second woe, and the third woe is coming shortly after that in prophecy. Okay, In verse 1, we break into the text here. Then I was given a reed, like a measuring rod. The angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who <coughs> worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive stands and the two lampstands standing before God and the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth, and devours their enemies, and if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, and they have power over waters to turn them into blood and strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Where have we heard this before? Mm -hmm. Elijah. Yeah. yeah. And what about Moses, too? Yeah. You know, think of Elijah and Moses, the powers that they had. Okay? And they were very much physical beings, right? When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Well, guess what? That means they're flesh, mm -hmm. right? Indeed, yes. You can't, I don't know. Human beings can't kill angels, can they? <laughs> and, and, and right there, Tony, yeah. let me just insert this. Sure. In, in Luke uh, chapter 20, let me digress. Jesus, in answering a question from the Sadducees, who wanted to know whose wife a particular woman was going to be, as she did not bear children, and the tradition was to hand her down mm -hmm. to the brother upon brother upon brother. And so they asked him, so in the resurrection, verse 33 of Luke 20, whose wife is she going to be? For seven had her, seven guys had her. And Jesus said, the children of the world marry and are given in marriage, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, that is the spirit world, the, and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. What Jesus was saying is angels don't make baby angels. There's no sexual event or intercourse <laughs> going on with angels. We don't have baby angels. Angels yeah. don't do that. They don't marry, they don't make babies. And neither can they die. Right. Now over here, in uh, where Tony was, go ahead Tony, you mentioned that they died. Okay, they, and killed them. And picking back up here in verse eight, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into the graves or into graves that was inserted by me. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry and send gifts to one another. 
Because these two prophets, notice that, not that's angels. That's important. That's a big one right there. That's, that's the, uh, the identity. Yeah. That's the identity. Yeah. Two right. prophets. So who are the two witnesses? Two, two physical prophets. human yeah. beings that are prophets of God. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And they're very much temporal, as we've seen here. Uh, these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Now, after the three and a half days, the breath of life of God entered into them, and they stood on their feet, and great, great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying uh, to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemy saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe was passed. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. So these guys are very powerful prophets <clears throat> to the point where they're going to plague the world, and they're going to send God's prophetic message to the fact where these guys are going to rejoice when these guys are gone. The people of the world. The people of the world, yeah. that is. And this highly symbolic language describing them and fire coming from their mouth and all that symbolic language uh, indicating that God is going to empower them and no one will be able to stop them or shut them up. And they will be able to do incredible wonders to provide the warning and witness and the gospel message that they'll be preaching. And at that point in time, in the scenario here, in the chronological scenario, uh, some have thought perhaps there will only be just a handful of Christians left. And some have even speculated that Maybe they'll be the only two living Christians left at this point because at this point, the church will have gone through the tribulation and the martyrdom of the saints. Which is the fifth seal. Yes. And, and it talks about the world rejoicing over them. And uh, you can only speculate how that would be accomplished. But with satellite technology, uh, everybody might see that on their big screen TV and rejoice over the fact that these two who have preach the truth and have tormented men with the truth are now dead, of course. And the, the main, their main witness is to the beast, to convict mm -hmm. the beast, that political machine of that socialistic, globalist government, that it is a tool of Satan the devil and it is demonically controlled by primarily three demons uh, uh, that's mentioned in Revelation later on. But the fact of it is, the fire coming out, I've often thought, uh, in, in many respects, as Wayne said, symbolic of the two-edged sword and sharpness of God's word and the conviction of which is going to come out of their mouth, uh, basically convicting this political machine, these, these right. people that are running this uh, operation to where uh, they are going to hate these two guys. They are going to try to get to these two guys like Grant took Richmond. I mean, he is, they, they are just really going to be targeted and finally are indeed going to be killed. And boy, is the world going to get shocked, as Tony pointed out when he read it, when they three and a half days later stand up and they brush themselves off and say, what, what, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah. 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 There we go. Whoa! There we go, you know. <laughs> and, and that resurrection, by the way, now we know, keep this in mind, this is where you, in knowing God's truth, in knowing God's truth, because people get confused, well, I thought that the resurrection don't happen to the seventh trumpet. You know, they, they couldn't be spirit, right? Right, right. I hear you. Yeah. But, but remember, Elijah was carried away. Yeah. And some years later, even wrote a note back, you know, to, uh, to Israel, letting them know. And they even went and looked for him. They sent out a search party for Elijah. So the point of it was, even though Elijah was taken away, he was taken away physically. He wasn't translated or in any way converted into spirit. No, he was just taken away. And on the other side of the mountain, they sent a search party out for him, looking for him. They never did find him. Right. But then he wrote a letter back some years yeah. later, you know, telling them about something. But my point in this, same thing. Remember, these guys are executing the ministry of Elijah. Same thing. Elijah, to, almost to the T, repeating again the patterns of God, the patterns of God. And so there they go physically being taken, swept yes. up physically, yes, right. and taken out of the picture. They serve their purpose. Yeah. Get on the bench, guys. Go sit somewhere. You know, I don't know where they're going. Don't ask me. But they're going yeah. somewhere, and God's taking them out of the, of the, uh, the play. The right. And, and, and the fact that it says they're resurrected and then ascend up to heaven doesn't, doesn't imply third. or mean the heaven where God exists, where the angelic realm exists, and so forth and so on. The atmosphere... And we have numerous references in uh, 
uh, like passages in scripture where going up into the air is called going up into the heaven or into heaven. The word heaven is used three different ways in the Bible. The place where the, the angelic realm, the spiritual realm, the heavens of the immediate atmosphere of this earth, and the heavens of the universe. Mm -hmm. and, and so we must not assume that that's talking about uh, a resurrection into heaven. It, like Bill said, it, it must coincide with what we already know about n no one can uh, ascend up into heaven prior to the scenario of Christ's return. And, and to uh, kind of uh, put an exclamation mark on that point, and, and here's where knowing the Bible, going back and connecting the dots in Scripture, you understand in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, keep this in mind here, let's underscore it with Scripture, what, what Wayne just said, proving it by Scripture. Every man, verse 23, 1 Corinthians 15, every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those at Christ's coming. This is only the second woe. When these guys get taken away, that's only the second woe. The right. third woe is coming. You'll know when those guys get taken away, and you see that like Wayne had uh, conjectured here, maybe on television or something, the second woe is ended, buckle up, because here comes the third woe. And now we're rounding third and heading home. Point being, though, Christ has not yet returned. So 1 Corinthians 15, we know those two witnesses were not translated into spirit. They were just taken out of the way like Elijah. Same thing. Yes. And at this point, whatever number, whatever the number is of Christians who remain, because Christ said he would not allow the gates of hell to prevail against the church, there still will be a church, a very small remnant. But at this point, they're sure enough going to understand prophecy. And like Bill said, they're, they're going to know that it's time for that next war. Yeah, yeah. And, and to Bill and Wayne's uh, point as well, both of their points, you know, Revelation 11, uh, verse 15, talks about the, the uh, seventh trumpet sounding, and the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, he does not even return until Revelation chapter 19. That's right. Yeah. So there's a whole host of insets that we have to prophecy and it's going to surprise a lot of us. Well, that's what a lot of people don't, don't really understand, is that the book of Revelation is a prime example of time insets that don't seem to follow sequentially in a timeline. But when you understand that they are inset time-wise to give us clarity about events, uh, that, that puts it all into focus. And you'll have an event described, and then maybe a few ver verses later, It'll talk about something or speak to something that happened prior to that other event. That's what we call an inset, a time inset. It brings you up to speed then. Yes. But there is an overall three sets, uh, three sets of seven that underscore the timeline of Revelation. There are seven seals that open up into the seven trumpets, that open up into the seven plagues, and there are four wars mentioned in Revelation. And they're located in Revelation 6, the fourth seal, the fourth horseman, and in Revelation 9, where there's two more wars, and then, of course, the fourth war is the Battle of Armageddon. We understand that. But there are three other wars leading up to the Battle of Armageddon, which is Jesus coming back and fighting mankind and so on, that are also salt and peppered throughout in the sequence that Wayne is referencing yeah. in Revelation that all fall in play, right. and the next big war up ahead of us in Revelation 6 verse 8 talks about 25% uh, of mankind being destroyed. Yeah, and right. at our numbers today, that's a factor of 21 times the death toll of World War II. Yes, right. yeah. wow. It's a big war. And the it's book of Revelation, those, that timeline, of those insets, all of it we can see in the, in the timeline really that's given to us by the Olivet Prophecy. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us an Olivet Prophecy. And that is the, the guiding timeline for all of it. Yeah. And the book of Revelation does indeed conform to that timeline yeah. with the insects. Uh, if, if I could, um, allow me to add one more set of seven to this, because there's something that we don't know about. The thunders, the thunders. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's going to be a surprise yeah. for everybody. Uh, just to illustrate a point, when it comes to prophecy, you know, it's very important that uh, we leave our mind open to certain possibilities and we don't get stuck into certain scenarios because that's when disappointments happen. In Revelation mm -hmm. chapter 10, listen to this, because sometimes we forget about this. Mm -hmm. Now, some scholars will say that the events of Revelation chapter 10 unfold later off 
uh, end of the book of Revelation, but it's very clear that these are sealed up, and we really don't know what they say or what, what the utterance were. In verse 1 of chapter, I saw a, a chapter 10 rather, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, he cried with a loud voice, as when a, a lion roars, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, I was about to write, he says, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven trumpets uttered, and do not write them. Maybe some surprises? Who knows? That's why I say it's okay to look towards history, history, the book of Daniel and so on, match it with the book of Revelation, but be very, very careful about getting caught up into certain scenarios that are based primarily on um, speculation. And there are a lot of uh, ministries out there that are predicated on just that, speculative prophecies that, quite frankly, aren't any dif different any better than Wayne's speculation or Bill's speculation yeah. or my speculation. It's just that speculation. So try to keep an open mind uh, when you're talking about prophecy. Try not to get, unless the Bible speaks dogmatically about prophecy, don't speak dogmatically about prophecy. Well, some, some of us here uh, have a memory uh, of when the church... <laughs> Uh, did exactly that. They went so far out on a limb that the limb eventually broke. They set dates for the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, you would have thought that they learned the lesson, you know. And all of those scriptures that tell us that we can't know, they didn't just suddenly appear. They were in the Bible even back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, we have a history of that, don't we? We go back to the 1843, 1845, we've got the Millerites. The Great Disappointment, which gave rise to the Adventist. Of course, Ellen G. White and her prophecies became the focal point. CG7. CG7. It goes on and on and on. And when you speculate in prophecy, the end result almost always is disappointment and lost faith in the congregations. By the, by the same token, we have a more sure word of prophecy, the, the Apostle yeah, Peter tells Peter us, that, because yeah. of our relationship with Jesus Christ and the fact that we can now see Scripture, understand Scripture, understand the Torah, understand the prophecies of Isaiah and Zechariah and all of them through the prism of Jesus Christ, through the lens that he provides for us, we have a more sure word of prophecy. And, and we are very, very clear on those prophetic events that we do indeed, uh, that we are indeed clear on, you know. And, and, and excuse, go ahead. No, I, I pretty much finished what I needed to say. <laughs> but, we, but we do need to be careful about being too uh, too speculative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. However, to your point and, and to what Wayne is uh, mentioning, and this goes to the focus of, through Jesus Christ, yes, and the focus of Israel and the, the layout of the landscape of prophecy as it surrounds the story of Israel from Genesis 12 when the proposition was given to Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, who had a son Isaac and ten down to Jacob, who had 12 sons made up the 12 tribes of Israel, this story, which is consistent, it's a continuum from Genesis to Revelation, is, is embedded in these words. And so the focus in following through Christ, his, his um, worldview on this begins to come to life through the voices of the prophets to illustrate to us where all this is leading and where we're heading as a nation once you begin to identify who are the recipients of the birthright and who are carrying the name Israel? Ah, That's yeah. important. Very important That's indeed. Good. Yes, because uh, the end time scenario, the great tribulation, all of that, it is indeed commensurate with the time of Jacob's trouble. Mm -hmm. Jacob's trouble leads the world into a catastrophic situation. And when you see these wars mentioned throughout the book of Revelation, now you start, you can start plugging in a little bit of similarities to the voices of the prophets and begin to tie these dots together in recognizing, whoa, if we don't change, since right. we're carrying this name once you prove that of Israel, don't change our culture, if we don't change our particular ways and lifestyles that we as a culture are behaving in, we're heading into a brick wall. We're, we're, we are on a, a trajectory of destruction. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. Daniel, the prophet, in Daniel chapter 12, talks about a time when 
Michael, that great That's prince right. of Israel, stands up in the end times. A lot of people get this image when Michael stands up that he's standing up to fight. But the imagery is not there. The imagery is that Michael covers Israel with his wings uh, speaking. When he stands up, his covering goes with him. Right. So essentially, God has fulfilled his promise to <clears throat> Israel. The people are identified as Israel today, and he's finished his promises. It's up to us to maintain our connection to him. We don't maintain our connection to what they call the cornerstone. Well, once we reject that cornerstone, Katie bar the door, here comes the woes. Mm -hmm. right? Here comes Jacob's trouble. Uh, you, 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 you bring up a very interesting point, too, about the timeline of prophecy. We don't want to speculate, which we've made that point here very clear. And, uh, but in the book of Daniel, Daniel wanted to know. Daniel's big thing was his curiosity. He wanted to understand scripture. He was passionate about it. And uh, in the beginning of the book, uh, the archangel Gabriel visits him and says, I have come to inform you, and he, and he teaches him. And much of the book of Daniel is really testimony from Gabriel that he received from God to give to Gabriel. And in that 12th chapter, Daniel wanted to understand. He still wants to know. He wants to understand. And Gabriel said, seal up the book, Daniel. Go your way. And then he makes this, this enigmatic statement that in the end time, people will be running to and fro. Knowledge will be increased, and people will be running to and fro. And there's been all kinds of speculation about what that means. Sure. And, uh, you know, we know that knowledge certainly has been exponentially increased. It's increasing even now faster than they can write books to contain it. And uh, people are running to and fro in trains and cars and boats and automobiles and rocket ships and everything else. However, I think we've come to have somewhat of a different understanding about that as well. You know, the knowledge that he wanted to know had nothing to do with science, had nothing to do with the price of real estate. It was he wanted to know about the word of God and about the prophecies. And many would be running to and fro. Well, I hope this don't sound in any way vain, or, or I, I don't know how to, how to set this up other than to say, for the last 35 years, Bill and I have been running to and fro. And this gentleman runs to and fro. And others who are doing God's work here in the end time, are running to and fro. And I believe that that must be thought of in, in a, as at least a possible understanding in connection with that. And if that be the case, then we're very far down the line prophetically in the timeline. That's, That's right. the point. Because yeah. we're understanding something. Right. Yes. And, and to your point, Wayne, in uh, 1 John chapter 2, we're told, Beloved, we are in the last hour. Yes. 2,000 years ago. So what does that mean for us? Uh, are we in the last uh, half hour? Yeah. Are we in the last 20 minutes? The doomsday clock. Is five it's, till. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, in other words, we're not going backwards. Is it a quarter to 12? Soon. I don't know. I yeah. think it might be about 11.58. The, the point is we don't know. That's why Jesus said watch and be ready. Yeah. We don't know. We do not know. So... That was a long explanation of the two witnesses. <laughs> there you go. Um, we got to start moving here. Yeah. yeah. So the two witnesses are not angels. They are two prophets in flesh and blood, human beings, okay? All right. Here's the next question. Can you elaborate on distinct, excuse me, distinctions between Son of Man versus Son of God? Are they interchangeable? Uh, are they interchangeable or... Are there a nuance in these terms? The short answer to that question is yes. They are. Yeah. They are. Well, it, what comes to mind immediately is uh, for, in the book of Ezekiel, for instance, God addresses Ezekiel in, in that same way. He speaks mm -hmm. to him as son of man. Oh, yeah. son of man, right. You know. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a term that can apply to us, of course. And the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus Christ, to, to highlight and portray his humanity and the fact that he was indeed flesh and blood, he is the Son of Man as well as the Son of God. So it's a very important term, but it is the one that Jesus used most often, the Son of Man. Yeah. Yes. So to, to Paul's words, he is the second Adam. And, and, it, yeah. and it's very important in understanding uh, the Sabbath because he tells us that the Sabbath was made for man, that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You That's know. right. And the Lord uses the term son of man in reference to himself in Matthew chapter 24. Mm -hmm. The book of Daniel uh, references uh, Christ, as we know, as he was in the fiery furnace with the Babylonian names of 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. One like unto the Son of Man. I see, we put three men into the fire furnace, but I see four. One like unto the Son of Man walks with them. Paraphrasing, of course. but So we, both, we all know that Jesus, uh, when he was uh, coming to the flesh and blood, he was both fully human. He was both fully divine. So it is just as correct to call him the Son of God mm -hmm. as it is correct to, to, to call him the Son of Man because he fulfilled both of those aspects. So they can be used interchangeably, but also there are nuances as well because one uh, term speaks uh, a nuance of his physicality because uh, he divested mortality. himself, his mortality, uh, his vulnerability, if you will, while mm -hmm. he was in the flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to that, he was fully divine, and that's a concept that makes my mind just poof, kind of blows my mind. Right, because he was both. He yeah, was he was both. both. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And he came to play that role. And to your point, to Tony's point, if you go to Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible underscores this. Uh, aspect of the Son of Man as it pertains to Jesus because it says here, uh, but one in a certain uh, place testified saying, and, and the quotation here comes out of Job chapter 7 verse 17 where the writer of Hebrews uh, says, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the Son of Man that you visit him, meaning human beings. You made him a little lower than angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he, God, put all in subjection under him, he, God, left nothing that is put under him, but now we see not yet all things put under him, meaning man. Not all things are being put under man. Man, man is thought of by God because ultimately God has great destiny for mankind. You're being called to be kings and priests and to rule and reign and to be co-heirs with Christ of the whole universe. However, we are not there yet, he says, the writer does. But what do we see? He says, we see Jesus, of all things. What? Mm -hmm. Verse 9. Mm -hmm. See Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. He was human. Right. He was lower than, he was more <clears throat> fu uh, futile. There was more, uh, it was a more uh, uh, creation of futility. He was uh, in a weaker state, a little lower than angels. Why? For the suffering of death. What's all that about? He couldn't die in his non-carnate form. He was spirit. He was in the spiritual dimension. He had to take on flesh in order to suffer death. And to put himself, Tony used the word, the word Mike James spoke about it. He had to be vulnerable. He had to give up his divinity and become mortal to where he was destructible, corruptible, and finite instead of infinite, whereby he was on the ice. He was out there. He could have failed in that respect. Right. And if he couldn't have, you don't have a savior. He was tempted in every way. You and I are tempted and subject in the bondage unto death, right. non-existence. Right. And so it says here, he was crowned, uh, he says here, to suffer death, crowned with glory and honor, this is verse nine, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Verse 10 now, chapter 2. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. Dropping down. It says in verse 16. For verily he took not on the nature of angels. There was nothing spiritual about Jesus in his uh, incarnate form. He was physical, mortal, and if it weren't for the power of the Father going through him, through the Holy Spirit that Jesus had, Jesus was powerless. He admitted it, that without the Father, I am nothing. He is greater than I. Yes. So it was always the Father's power being manifested through Christ who gave the miracles and so forth, but Christ, by his own admission, was mortal. Yeah. Yes. Was mortal. Yes. Yes. And so he says here, so verily he did not take on the nature of angels, but to Tony's point, this underscores where Christ and why Christ is considered the son of man. He took on the seed of Abraham, which is a metaphor of the human tabernacle. That's right. right. He took That's on right. the human tabernacle. Right. That's right. In, in fact, uh, what Bill's talking about here, what we've all mentioned uh, to some degree, is the fact that Jesus Christ had to be born in the flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. He had to be mortal. He had to subject himself to futility just like he had to be. Otherwise, we don't, we don't have a savior. Right. Um, one of the, the biggest controversies or heresies, if you will, that was going on in the early church, in fact, if my memory serves me correct, and I'm going out on a limb here, it's not in my notes or anything like that, but 
Docetism. Yeah. Docetism. Gnostics. Gnostics was a big thing in the church, and what uh, uh, Docetism taught was Jesus wasn't really flesh and blood. No. He just simply appeared yeah. to be flesh. Well, and that, blood. that's a great lie, a great blasphemy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus Christ had to be flesh and blood, not only to die to pay for our sins, because the wages of sin is indeed yeah. death but also to experience our frame and our dust, to know what it is to be human. His experience here, to, 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 to find out what it's like to be a human, to, to understand what it means to be disappointed, to understand what, it, what, a, what a heartache is when someone betrays you, to understand the foibles of a human, the weaknesses of a human, to get tired, to get cold, to be angry, to be upset, to be disappointed. He had to experience all of that to be the competent high priest on our behalf that he is mm -hmm. now. He had to know what it's like to be flesh and blood. That's right. And indeed, mm -hmm. he discovered that for us. Yes. That's right. You know, the Lord Jesus was, was so fleshly, I, I, I get a little bit of laughter sometimes when I talk about this, but I, it's not for the sake of laughter. I say it to make, make the point. Jesus, as a carpenter, was a morally perfect man but that don't mean he necessarily was a perfect carpenter. He may have cut a two before too short. <laughs> or he may have hit his thumb with a hammer when he was trying to drive a nail. <laughs> you know, If he ate an onion, he had bad breath. Yeah. If he didn't bathe, he'd have body odor. When they, when they crucified him, he bled. He was flesh and blood. That's right. And that blood, yeah. I've called it the blood of God. And indeed, yes. Yeah. Well, we have, we have two gospel narratives uh, that don't make any sense whatsoever if what we're saying isn't true. Uh, and these two narratives rely solely on the fact that Jesus Christ was flesh and blood and he was vulnerable. We have Matthew chapter 4. We have Luke chapter 4 in which the, the devil tempted our Lord and Savior for 40 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a real temptation. Now, do we think that Jesus ever came close to the precipice of jumping off that, that, that precipice of sin? I don't think so. Uh, at a certain point in his life, he realized who he was, what he had at the beginning, what he was going back to, and certainly he was motivated by that. And, of course, the pressure of the world was on his shoulders because something has to factor in about him wanting to take responsibility and care for his very own creation. He had all of our lives in jeopardy with him, too. Mm -hmm. And so those two temptations in Matthew 4 and Luke chapter 4 make absolutely no sense if he wasn't flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. Of they, course. They weren't Satan wasn't a appealed to him on that level. And, and the right. Lord knew he could fail, mm -hmm. and that was a constant in his mind. I will not fail. I must not fail. Mm -hmm. yes. That's right. right. And he stayed, he stayed strong by fasting and praying. That's the example we have. And quoting the word of God when temptation came to him. Yeah. yeah. Every word of God. Yeah. Not just the ones in red. The ones in red are important. But there is a theology out there that says all we need to do is study the letters in red, and I'm sure we'd agree that if we study the letters in red, we'd be a lot better people than most people are, yeah, right? than what yeah, we were right. before. But there's more to it. But there's more to it. Well, because Christ said we must live by every word that has proceeded from the mouth of God. And that includes That's both Old Testament yeah. and New Testament, and the record of which he spoke even through some of his prophets would include that as well. So we can't just limit our understanding to the letters in red. Right, right. right. Okay. And, and it goes to this point, too, going back to the Gnostics. Uh, Serenthus was a, a pain in the neck to the Apostle John in the late years of uh, the Apostle John's life when he wrote his epistles. Uh, he, he was really upset over the Gnostic influence and the Hellenistic influence as well from the Greeks. But the Gnostics were really a pain, as they would say, in his neck. And they were, they were advancing, as Tony was pointing out, the fact that Jesus never died. He didn't even experience pain in his uh, day of passion that it was a hologram, that what you saw on the stake was a hallucination, and Jesus was actually outside of his body. He never was mm -hmm. feeling the pain of the whipping and so on. And Serenthus, along, Serenthus, along with some others, were, were advocates of this concept and this idea. And brethren, today, you think that Gnosticism doesn't have continued influence in our modern denominational Christian community. Right. It, it does. does. Mm -hmm. It does. Case in point, the Jehovah's Witnesses who think that Jesus is uh, the Archangel Michael. Secondly, also with the, uh, the advent of many Baptists today, if you ask them, did Jesus die? They'll say no. The three days and three nights, or in their case, a day and a half, that he was in the, uh, he was in the, uh, uh, the tomb, 
He wasn't, he wasn't dead. He was down in Tartarus. He was talking to the demons in Tartarus. And I submit to you, that's a Gnostic, that's a Gnostic Sorry. teaching. Christ died. He was for three days and three nights. If the Father did not come back and rescue him from the grips of death, He'd still be he dead. would have never rose. That's right. He went right. to the grave saying, my Father, why have you forsaken, forsaken. me, thinking yeah. he was abandoned, but in faith died knowing full well the plan. He trusted the plan. He trusted the plan. That's right. And he came back. And if back. Christ had failed, we, we can speculate, but if Christ had failed, I've got this idea. It's just a Wayne Hendricks theory. <laughs> but I've got this idea that if that Christ had indeed failed, because all of creation is upheld by the integrity of his word, by the word of his mm -hmm. power. He is the creator. He is the savior. If he had failed, what would have happened in the moment of that failure? in the moment of that sin, if Christ had indeed sinned. Well, we can only speculate, but I think it's ent entirely likely and, and, and possible that uh, the entire creation would have reacted in some, oh, some fashion, some yeah, kind of way. a black hole. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And, uh -huh. and had he sinned, he is the resurrection and the life. Had he sinned, not only was there no salvation for us, but there would have been none for him either. The word of God, God the word in the flesh, was dead for three days and three nights. God the word as a human, who became human. Son of man. Yes, son of man, son of man and man. son of God. Yeah. And had he failed, brother, it's over. Yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's extend something that, that you said about people believing that Jesus Christ was formerly an angel. Mm -hmm. All right. the, the Apostle Paul had a little something to say about that because he was dealing with these Gnostics, right? Here's what he says in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, verse 4. Oh. I'll just start there for time's sake. Hebrews 1 and verse 4. Jesus Christ was not an angel that was turned into flesh and blood. He was the word from eternity. Yes. He was the one that was slain before the foundation of the world was. And the Apostle Paul, whom I firmly believe wrote the book of Hebrews, and it was never a question in the minds of the early church, and we do have faith that the early church knew who wrote what epistles that they read, correct? Right. So yes. no matter how many people want to contend that fact, um, in verse 4, it says, Having become so much better than the angels, he has by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you, and again, yeah. Yeah. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Clearly, right. he didn't say it to an angel. Okay. And that point is, is redundant. It's grammatically redundant. It's hammered over and over and over to make the point. And again, over in verse 13, to yeah. your point. Yeah. But to which of the angels said he, this is verse 13, still chapter 1, where Tony was, said at any time, uh, sit on my right hand until I, make, uh, uh, until I make your enemies thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits? Christ was not a ministering no. spirit. Right. He was right. an atonement. Yes. He was a sacrificial lamb. And in that statement, Hebrews, uh, uh, that, that verse of scripture there, verse 14, yeah. uh, the, my, it's my understanding that the, the most modern uh, Kini uh, translation, Kini Greek translation, renders that as, were they not all sent forth from creation to uh, facilitate the heirs of salvation? Yeah, because yeah. it says sent forth to minister, to your point, sent forth, the rest of the scripture, sent forth to minister for them, right. all of us, for them, uh, who shall be heirs of salvation. Right. Yeah. And a third of them left that estate for which they were created, that function, that purpose, that design for them that God had when he created them, a third of them left that estate. Habitat, yep. yeah. Well, that was quite a digression. Yeah. <laughs> what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we answered it somewhere. Yeah, there. somewhere, there was, somewhere is your answer. What was the question, my dear? <laughs> <laughs> this is why you never give a uh, stage to three pastors. Yeah. Right? We, don't, we don't do that. There's a danger in that. We, we, we talk. We like to talk. All right, guys. Let's move on to our, uh, our next question. So we want to make sure we get every question uh, the best yeah. we can. <laughs> Maybe we won't get to them. We'll, we'll try. <laughs> we'll see. In the millennium, when will someone who accepts Jesus turn to spirit? Upon baptism? Ooh. End of life? If there is no death, 
Will you just change? Ooh, there's a good one right there. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, first of all, uh, the Bible does not talk about three resurrections. The Bible talks about three judgments, two resurrections. Okay, and so it's important to maintain that distinction uh, when we talk about uh, what's going to happen in the millennium. Um, I don't see any need why anybody would have to die and be resurrected if they're in the millennium and they accept Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, but uh, I admit I speculate on that. Mm -hmm. That's speculation on my part. Well, uh, something that must enter into the, the equation, the answer was already referenced by Bill when he read that in, uh, in the book of Revelation here. Uh, you know, the first resurrection uh, uh, references those who uh, come to a relationship with Jesus Christ all the way from Adam up until the time of his return, and the rest of the dead don't live until later on after the thousand years, you know. The Bible does not nail down every nuance of understanding on some of those issues. And, and so we can make uh, educated uh, assumptions in some cases. This is an interesting question because in due respect to your point, Wayne, uh, there's another group of people during the millennium. Uh, let's say my wife and I, Margie and I, uh, and we were younger and she was of childbearing age uh, and uh, we survived the tribulation and we were part of the group that uh, you all collected and took us back to Palestine to make up the physical nation of Israel at the commencement of the millennium. That's going to be that city on the hill representing the ensign for all the Gentiles to be drawn to. And so Margie and I have a baby. And uh, that baby grows up in the millennium and is a nurturing child. You know, he grows up and all of a sudden he's Jacob's age. And then he's, uh, you know, Nate's age, and then he's my age. <laughs> but the point of it is, these people are born. We had this question in New York uh, at a Bible study that I conducted Tuesday of this week, and it was interesting. So I wanted to, because it brought back to my attention old uh, scriptures here of Isaiah 65. And Isaiah 65, uh, we do have a an inkling of a uh, kind of a kind of a clue, but it's still somewhat uh, ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. But it does put you in an arena of concept. It puts you into a, a ballpark, a stadium. Uh, it doesn't really define the game that you're there watching, uh, but it does put you kind of in in a play, uh, into play here. It says um, um, there, uh, verse twenty, talking about the, in the, you go through the context and so on here. And it talks about, uh, for behold, to create a new heavens and a new earth. This is verse 17, chapter 65. And the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind, but you will be glad and rejoice. Verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem. Joy in my people, the voice of weeping shall be no more. Verse 20 now. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that has not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. And they shall build houses, and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat and fruit of them. They shall build and another inhabit. Meaning you're going to own property in the millennium. How about that? Hey, How yeah. about that? <laughs> you mean it's not socialism? It's not communism. Not <laughs> no communism. Yeah, you can own property. No communism. Now, don't talk about politics. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's government. On the government. Government. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's it. We're not talking politics. It's government. We're talking government. Yeah. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall uh, not plant and another eat. Uh, for as the days of a tree, the days of my people, the mind of the elect shall uh, long enjoy the work of their hands and not be taxed. Any no, I'm just kidding. Verse 23. And they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass... That before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. I don't know, what does that mean? See, you, 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 you don't, are they going to be changed? You, you just, you know, you're in the ballpark. But again, how can we answer it emphatically? I don't know. I don't have the answer emphatically. Will my son in that millennium at 100 years old, or when I hit 100 years old, may I, maybe I'm 20 at the beginning of the millennium, I hit 100, and now I'm judged and assessed and, and uh, discerned as to whether or not I may. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we're in the ballpark here. What all this means, how it applies to the resurrection, it doesn't really say. It's really ambiguous in some respects. 
But this 100-year principle does somewhat have some play in the, uh, in the millennium and in certainly the kingdom of it, God. It paints a picture of, of life in the millennium, the reign right. of Jesus sure Christ and, and the and, saints. And look at verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. When does that happen? And the lion yeah. shall eat straw right. like a bullock. Yeah. Isaiah 11, yeah. connected with Isaiah 11. Here he is, Isaiah uh, 65, he's repeating himself of what he said in 11. They shall not hurt nor right. destroy in all my holy mountain. Isaiah 2, they shall not learn the ways of war anymore. Right. Isaiah 2, you know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So we're talking about it here, uh, but again, your guess is as good as mine. There's some things that are just not uh, real crystal clear uh, for us to know at this time. Some of the details, we just don't know certain details. Right. You know. But what we do know that this individual's class of people, though, they'll be okay whether they're changed or the second resurrection, no matter what God chooses to do with this. Um, they're, they're going to be okay, so that's... Uh, except those sinners. Except those sinners. Yeah, except those sinners. <laughs> These yeah. sinners being yeah. 100 years yeah. old they, they, they shall are, be accursed. Yeah. Yeah. I, was talking, I was talking about the ones who accepted and would be changed right, specifically. Right. Um, but yeah, we are we are on a little bit, admittedly, on some speculative points there, but uh, like Bill said, we do have a little bit of a template that we can we can draw from on this. So I uh, hope that answered, uh, hope it answered that question there. All right, here's one that has been a uh, topic of controversy for many, 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 many Christian centuries. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, if you turn there with me, please. Uh, Genesis 6. And I'll read the question as you turn there. That way you'll have the background. You're probably there before I am, actually. But <clears throat> Here we go. Can someone explain Genesis 6? Chap, uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it seems giants were the result of sons of God that came into the daughters of men. Uh, what were the sons of God? Well, that's a good question. And I think it, uh, it is a very expansive answer to this, of the nature of angels. Well, um, part of the question has already been answered yeah. by, by something that Bill read. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, angels do not marry, nor do they give and marry. They are sexless, even their mm -hmm. names imply that we only have the name of Gabriel and Michael, Michael, but those are names that don't have gender attached to them. And, and we've already read those scriptures mm -hmm. that they, don't, they do not procreate. That's yes. right, that's right. Well, that's just a Which means they don't carry, without getting too graphic, right. seed. They don't carry seed that can break the veil from the spirit world into right. the physical world. Now, there's a theory, or uh, what you could say, a, a theology, I guess, whereby, uh, you know, they claim that uh, angels, uh, there were, a, a, and it comes from the Book of Enoch, primarily, right. that is, yeah. Uh, yeah. which uh, there was 150 of them, I think it was led by Raphael, the angel, yeah. Yeah. and uh, he broke the veil, and uh, God was a Johnny-come-lately to the situation, didn't get the memo, and caught him, <laughs> and uh, consequently uh, stopped it, and had has put them in Tartarus, so to speak, right. uh, for the time. And they're yeah. locked up. They can't do it. Uh, but in the latter day, they're going to do it again. Right. And uh, consequently, uh, the women are going to become vulnerable to these spirit beings. They're going to ravish and, and rape and pillage. But um, yeah. there is no scriptural no. evidence no. of that kind of thinking. In fact, it goes against things that we have firm understanding of. Right. God is a creator. He is procreating through us. We are made in his image. We can procreate. But angels, in their natural spirit form, they don't even look like us. They're not made in our image. They have no resemblance to God in that respect. They are not creative. We are creative. God is creative. That may be part of the controversy that Satan was able to, you know, raise against uh, the plan of God, you know, that uh, God is procreating through uh, these clay images who will have capabilities that we don't have. And they're being offered a, a position with him and in his, in his family and to inherit who and what he is and all that he has created, and we're just going to serve them. But angels, the, the, the brief descriptions that we have of them, they're bizarre-looking things. They are not created like us. Now, they are changeling on missions from God. We know that they can appear in humanoid form, but their natural state in the spirit realm, 
They are sexless beings that have no image of God or of man. No, absolutely no, go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was just going to say that, uh, I forgot my thought. That's yeah. okay. Let's, let me, uh, have a senior moment. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. I have those, I have those a lot. No, no I'm not. Uh, let me bring up two points. Number one, let me play the advocate just a little bit here if I could. Yeah. Okay. Because there are those people, and now Wayne, to your point, I, I believe what you say, because the word Gabe, Gabriel and Michael are gender neutral, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. However, when you see angels in the Bible listed, specifically... Uh, Gabriel is described as a man. Gabriel, uh -huh. They appear in the masculine form, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So in all the, for lack of a better way to put it, the epiphanies where people had contact with angels, mm -hmm. okay? Does anybody remember anyone having contact with a female angel? No. No. Don't no, you have to have... Not uh, in the Bible. Not in the Bible. But in movies. In movies. In right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you, you mean, they even have wings. They have wings. <laughs> they have a series on TV. And they're in robes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, but you're talking fairy tales. Yeah. Right? But in the reality of it is, in order I to... I thought to, angels were little babies flying around with, you know, carrots. Oh, the, the carrots? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we get that too. But if we're going to uh, look at this specifically uh, and technically, to procreate, you have to have male... You have to have female. Yeah. In the angelic word, world, you don't see the either. No. And Jesus neutral. answered that clearly. Yeah, clearly. he answered that clearly. But, but to another point, um, the Nephilim, if you will, or the giants that's talked about here in Genesis chapter 6, angels cannot procreate with human humankind. Uh, they were men of renown, men of old, men of stature, if you will. And But if you read the pre preceding chapter, there are two lines that come through this that are being talked about. You got the line of Cain and mm -hmm. the line of Seth. Yes. Uh, one was a moralistic line that, that adhered to or stayed tethered to the God of, uh, of the Old Testament. And you had another line that was amoralistic. Mm -hmm. So what you had here is a commingling of moral versus immoral. Right. That's really what the context is about. It has nothing to do right. with a supernatural uh, Meshing between spirit the breaking and flesh, of the veil, right. the breaking of that veil, yeah. and to Bill's point about the Book of Enoch, that's a part of the apocrypha, right? Uh, and that's something that has been discredited for right. for many, many years. And so many people use it because of the mention of it in Jude. Yeah, and in fact, Catholic theology is relying upon the apocrypha. Well, any cockeyed theological idea that you have, you can find some some way to back it up in the apocrypha. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Underscoring what Tony just. Uh, presented to us in Genesis chapter 4 and in verse 26 cutting to the chase uh, with this moral versus immoral and men were being called by such in Genesis 4 verse 26 and if you have your Bibles you ought to chain reference cha uh, um, Genesis 6 verse 2 where it says the sons of God chain reference your Bible right over to Genesis 4 verse 26, because here is clarity of what Tony's talking about. The scripture underscores it, what he said. To Seth, and to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he, he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord, or another Hebrew translation, to call themselves by the name of the Lord. What would that be? They were called the sons of God the sons of Elohim, the yes. sons of Yehovah. You know, these were, these were the ones, and these were the, the moral line, the line from Seth that Tony was referencing in this, in this regard. Just as an exercise, if I could take a moment, um, just, just as an exercise, Chuck, could you look Numbers 13, verse 33? And uh, Jeff, Jeff, could you look up... Um, Joshua 13, I think it's 12. I'm trying to read my handwriting here. Yeah, those two, those two, in reference to giants. Are you there, Chuck? Yes. Go ahead and read it loud. Project your voice. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. There you go. Jeff, you there? Joshua 13, 12. Joshua 13, 12. All the reign of Og and Bashan, who reigned in Asher, and Edre, who remained of the remnant of the 
Their fights for Moses had stricken and dispossessed them. The remnants of the of the yeah. Nephilim. Yeah. yeah, they were the. Oh, yeah, that's that's it. The, rem, the, rem, uh, the remnants. Yeah, 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 yeah. King James says giants. And I'm looking. Yeah. Okay, I, I have a, a little bit uh, the scriptures in South Africa because I, I like some of the, the words, so it might not be quite as clear. <clears throat> but there were giants. Yeah, and there that's the point. The point was that there was a there was a line of giants. Uh, brethren that uh, were well known in the area uh, and consequently um, uh, were not uh, were not that rare. I mean, they were this side of the flood still as well, yeah, yeah. that line. And the sons of Anak, of which uh, Chuck had read uh, there and clearly uh, articulated, uh, illustrates that line was still very prominent on the earth uh, at the time. In fact, Goliath had brothers. Yes, Goliath had yeah. brothers, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's why David took five stones. And he certainly stones. was a giant. Yeah, but, but not the giant that they portray him as. I think earliest rabbinical tradition has Goliath somewhere around seven foot six, seven foot nine, somewhere around there. Well, the numbers given in the, in the Bible, the cubits listed in the Bible, presents a possibility of nine, nine foot... Even up to 12? That's what I meant. Nine, nine foot, foot six or, meant, yeah. or 12 foot six, yeah. thereabouts. I don't know exactly. which cubit you use. Depending uh, on which cubit. You know, yeah. the distance from the elbow to the end of the outstretched hand yeah. or the, the fist. Right. Uh, so there's, there's two distinct uh, sizes. But it also goes to the idea that men originally were bigger than they are now. You know, the, the, the archaeologists discovered that going back way back in time, they discover the, the bones of men yeah. who are much, much bigger than we are today. That's right. Uh, in the days of the Lord Jesus in Judea at that time, the archaeologists have discovered that the Lord Jesus, we know that he was of, of average size. Mm -hmm. We have a number of scriptures that tell us he was very much average in that respect. Well, the average size of, of the uh, Judean men in those days was about five six. So if he, was, if he was as tall as me, he would have been a little bit taller than, you know, because I'm 5'8". Yeah. <laughs> the giants portrayed in the movies have been highly exaggerated from the biblical right. perspective. But back in the day, now a thousand years prior to that, the days of David, men averaged close to six feet tall. So I think that also possibly goes to the, uh, uh, I think I was talking with Chuck about this the other day. Uh, and with Jeff, every generation from Adam to now has diminished the human race. We send our best and brightest out to fight the wars, and we kill them, and the rejects are left behind to repopulate the race. <laughs> and as a result of that, after generation after generation after generation, not only have we miniaturized ourselves, we've also declined our intellect. Yes. Uh, just, again, an illustration. Go ahead, Chuck. Wikipedia, of course, is the best thing ever. <laughs> so, so the reason this translation I had is they had Raphaites, um, were the ancient race of giants in the Iron Age of Israel, according to Wikipedia. There you go. So yeah. they just used, used the Raphaites. As an indication of that. Speak all the crazy words anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, let me uh, just bring your attention to Deuteronomy 2, verse 10. Uh, the... Emims dwelt therein in time past. I'm just cutting to the chase here for time. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. This is another line of giants. They were as tall as the Anakims, uh, which also were accounted giants as the Anakims. But the Moabites called them Emims. Verse 20, that also, same chapter, this is Deuteronomy 2, verse 20. Uh, parentheses, that also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in, in old time, and the Ammonites called them uh, Zamzumims, Zamzumims, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. So this line of humans was well known. I mean, you know, and even in scouting out the Holy Land, Joshua, you know, they said we were like grasshoppers in their sights right. because of these. So these giants mentioned over in six, chapter 6 of Genesis 
uh, are, are human beings that were uh, naturally born of that particular line of humans. It's, you know, I mean, look at uh, like uh, LeBron James. I mean, you just you've got big guys playing basketball occasionally, you know. You go down to the Watusis and see some of those guys. I mean, seven foot coming in from sure. uh, certain areas. Right, right. I mean, they're amazing, amazing. But these, these men of old, these men of renown, they were, they were uh, giants uh, in terms of uh, accomplishments, uh, intellect, in various ways. They were indeed giants, and, and they had already uh, begun to covet uh, the, the daughters of, of the line of Seth. All right. Does that uh, let me let me ask a question? How does everybody feel right now? You okay to go? Do you want to keep going? We're an hour and a half in. Yeah, I want to give you the uh, if you're if you're not feeling it, let us know. We can give you. you want to keep going? Go for a little bit more. I had a, I had a quick thing with the uh, the giants. I've also read that uh, certain translations of, of that word could be uh, construed as tyrants or bullies. <coughs> I have I've seen that, yes. Yeah. So I didn't, I didn't they they weren't very nice, nice men. <laughs> yeah. So I've seen that translation too. Yeah. All right guys, we got another question here. Um, it centers around Moses, um, the prophet, and the question is, why was Moses not allowed in the promised land? And there's there's all kinds of different theories about this. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us that the Lord uh, told Moses to speak unto the children of Israel because they were complaining. They had no water and things like that. And speak to the rock, and water shall flow out. And then, lo and behold, next thing we know, Moses is allowed into the promised land, right? So why was he not allowed into the promised land? Well, he didn't do what God told him to do. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And he, he usurped authority that even he, Moses, did not have. He, he, he took the, the glory from, from the Lord and made it appear, even right. though that was not his intention, I don't think, but the results were the same, that he was the one that was bringing this to be. And it was God, in fact, who was telling him to do this. So it kind of pushes God out of the picture and pushes Moses to the front. And that's not really how God wanted to start uh, you know, Israel uh, in existence. There's also another theory out there uh, that exists uh, giving reason why Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land. And that theory is simply this, that Moses being a prophet and a teacher of God, his time was up. His time for teaching was over. It was time to essentially pass the baton on to somebody else. Well, the, the problem with that theory is that the scripture is clear. <laughs> Moses' natural strength was not abated. He was no, right. still hale and hearty mm -hmm. at that age. Uh, his death was determined, as it were, at that time. You know, uh, God said it's time. You know, that's right. And uh, but he was not. His strength was not abated. But the, the answer to this question was given to us by Charlton Heston. Who <laughs> was the real Moses? Right? He was the real Moses. He said, I disobeyed the Lord at the waters of Meribah, you know, yeah. and he struck that rock. And, yeah. just, so. and in addition to that, also, not only was it Moses' sin, but uh, some scholars also believe that was the entirety of Moses, or not Moses, but the, the wanderings of the children of Israel in the wilderness who <coughs> continuously provoked the Holy One to anger. And yeah. it was a culmination of all that, but the scripture is clear. Moses disobeyed God. And that was a, an incredibly great lesson for the children of Israel. Moses had, had reached almost godlike status in, oh, in their uh, way yeah. of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that uh, God had to send angels to hide Moses' body. He knew the people would make yeah. him an idol and end up worshiping him. That's right. Uh, but, but by not allowing Moses to go over, for Moses to have to pay for that sin and not go over, that made a great statement mm -hmm. To, the, to Israel. He's just a flesh and blood man like you who was doing what I told him to do. Right. And when he disobeyed me, there was a consequence. That's right. right. And to those of you who are parents out here, essentially, uh, God grounded Moses. He's yeah. grounded. Yeah. He's not allowed to go in. Yeah. Now, he'll ultimately be in the kingdom, obviously, but uh, to enter the promised land, that was his consequence for disobeying. And what he did, actually, if you go to Numbers 20, 
uh, where he took the rod. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and he said, that's what God said. He's talking to Moses now. He says, Take the rod, gather you the assembly together. This is verse 8, chapter 20, book of Numbers. Gather the assembly together, you and Aaron and your brother. Now look at this. And speak. Speak. Do not hit. <laughs> speak. That's what he said. Speak you to the rock before your eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and you shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, so that you give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together, um, and uh, he said um, unto them, Hear now, you rebels, must we, must we, that's the problem. Yeah, must he takes Ooh, credit. Ooh, he's taking credit. Second mistake. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with the rod, and he smote it, not once, twice. When God told him, look, don't hit the rock. I'm telling you, just speak. I want the credit, is what God is. God wants the credit for the manifestation of where that power came from. He wants no confusion about the fact that, well, maybe Moses got lucky and he hit a spring. You know, <laughs> whatever it is. My point is, God wanted him to speak, not hit, and certainly he didn't want Moses to say, must we, my brother and I, must we, my brother and I, Aaron, give you water? No, no, no. So now, the rest of the story over here in Deuteronomy, chapter um, 32, verse 51, because you trespassed against me among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you sanctified me not. You said, we, Moses, you and your brother Aaron, we. Yep. I didn't tell you to do that. Right. Why'd you do that? Come on. You know, come on, man. You know, you know. <laughs> he, say, he, says, he says, because you sanctify me not in the midst of the children of Israel, yet you shall see, you shall see the land. So I'm not going to completely put you in your room. Yeah. Shut the door. You got to go to the kitchen get something to eat if you want. Yeah, you want, yeah. yeah. Look out the window, but don't go out of the house. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and so he was kind enough to give him the scope, the landscape, and he could look at the promised land from afar. But then he later on then disappeared and God, God himself, Jesus, uh, in his pre-incarnate uh, form, buried him. Yes. Buried him. Yeah. Right. Because they had a good relationship. They had a tight, a tight relationship. And you know, Moses never whined. Moses never bellyed. I found that interesting. He did. Yeah. He, did he, didn't, oh, you know, he didn't cry or moan and grope about it. He, yeah. he, he took it like a man. He yeah. knew he, what he did. He and, accepted it. And he took accountability for it. And the scripture says he was the most humble of human beings. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. As we said, growing up, he took his come up. And, and he's the only right. human being <laughs> who right. had the distinct privilege and honor of seeing a somewhat protected but nevertheless glorified reality of God. As God hid him in the crevice of a rock. Yeah, put his hand up yeah, to block yeah, his glory yeah, yeah. so that Moses wouldn't be destroyed by the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, Moses was glowing yeah. <laughs> when yeah. he came out of that situation. Well, yeah. that, that was a unique relationship that Very. Uh, Christ had with uh, Moses because uh, he, face told, to he, face. he told Israel, to Moses I speak face to face, but to you yeah. I speak from a distance. Right, right. You know, that was they, they were kindred spirits. And it was yeah. indeed God the Word who became the Lord Jesus Christ, who spoke to Moses up there on the mountain. Mm -hmm. yes. And Moses mm -hmm. had to be kind of a, 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 a cool guy. He talk all the time. He had to be real easy. So he had, had, had his brother Aaron to speak, that's, that's right. to speak for him. Because you know? <laughs> he stuttered. He stuttered a lot. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's a good key to our calling, you know, uh, God's not always concerned with our initial abilities. No, that's what He's going to give you, or what He can give you to do the job He calls you to. And what a what a, a what a tool to use for God for God to use to illustrate that it was His power, not Moses. Right. You know yeah. who who could have been like a Saul. You know 
this big strapping oh, yeah. kind of a guy, you know, yeah. heads and shoulders above everybody. Ruddy guy, good right. Guy, uh, yeah. he, he picked Moses of all people. Yeah, you know? right. Well, clearly the lesson is that the, continually the Lord said that the children of Israel might learn to fear me. That's right. right. Yeah. To follow me, yeah. to rely upon me. And that's so, why it was so big, I think, for him when he said, we, my brother and I, once we yeah. fetch you the water, that was, a, that was a big disappointment to God. Oh, most certainly. Yeah. 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 That was a yeah. big disappointment. All right. Any questions, brother? Oh, we got some from the internet too. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Do you have any more? Left? Yeah, I do. Um, you want me to read this one? Yeah, go ahead. Can Satan. Satan read your thoughts or your prayers if you pray in your head silently? Well, if you can, he's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> That would explain a lot of things in my life. <laughs> well, I think it's important to mention that uh, uh, God is the only omniscient, omnipresent. Correct? Um, but that's not to say that we don't open our minds right. to the spiritual world sometimes. Right. That uh, question would be answered best on how much of that spirit world do we let in, the negative side of things. Right. And, and we can only surmise... Uh, Way, the ways of spirit beings, we only, we're limited in what we understand, mm -hmm. but they operate, like Mike was telling us, in a completely different dimension. Mm -hmm. and, and he does have great powers and abilities in that dimension. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike and I were talking after that sermon that day, and we were talking about the fact that uh, uh, the, the microphysics <laughs> of, of, uh, of science that that Mike referenced that day, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in uh, Luke 4, Matthew 4, in the temptation, Satan the devil was able, by, by some means that we can't perfectly understand or comprehend, but Satan was able to transport himself and the physical man, the Lord Jesus, who was indeed flesh and blood, from the desert to the pinnacle of the temple in a moment in time, instantaneously, you know, they didn't, they didn't walk there and then climb up a ladder. It was a transportation through a dimension. And then later on, they were able to go to the top of the highest mountain, and he showed him the kingdoms of the world, including his spirit kingdom, no doubt. But that was a moment, in, and as a matter of fact, Luke even calls it a moment in time. Yes. So he had supernatural powers uh, that, that the Lord Jesus allowed it to happen, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And on a practical level, uh, what the demons essentially are is they are uh, more than just casual observers of human behavior. Indeed. And I can't remember the statistics, but I can remember Bronson James years ago giving an example, I guess uh, he, he based his calculation on the stars in the heavens and how many angels uh, would have been in heaven originally created, how many of the third there were to fall. But I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of angels or how many thousands of angels there are for just for one human being. Mm -hmm. And they're observers of human behavior. Right. Right. And they're, they're around watchers. us. They're called watchers. They're called watchers. So it's not as if they're not aware of our thoughts in our, because they're watching us. Right. So it's not by any kind of a magical trick that they're doing this, but if you sit around and watch somebody long enough, you will learn something about them. Sure. Yeah. Right. yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. So if you watch somebody close enough, long enough, you'll know what they do. You'll know their habits. And the fact that uh, we have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, and we have stepped into the light of, I've heard many times eloquently by you, Wayne, and by you, Bill, that we become targets, we become visible to the spirit world. Right. And when yeah. you step into light, to Bill's uh, phraseology, what does light attract? Bugs. Bugs. Right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Bugs. So they are around us, they are aware, uh, but doesn't mean they're omniscient or omnipresent, all knowing or anything like that. But if they watch you long enough, they'll know your habits. Sure. Yeah. And as, the brighter you get, the more bugs you attract. There you go. <laughs> and as children of light, God is light, and his, his spirit is portrayed as light. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, uh, if we could see the way spirit beings see in that dimension, uh, I'm sure uh, I talked with Chuck about this prior to his baptism. 
and that uh, with the receiving of God's Holy Spirit, there's a light there that you have that you have now that you didn't have before. And that light makes you visible, makes you a target. And it's kind of like something we all know about. When you've been in the dark and you suddenly come into the light, it sort of hurts your eyes. It's an affront to you, you know. You are now an affront to the beings in that darkness. And they can see you very clearly, you know. Fortunately, God's Holy Spirit can give you what you need to overcome that and deal with that. He who's in you is greater than he who's in the world. Well, we need to be aware. That's the point. Right. Yeah, and not be naive about it. Yeah. You want another one? Is this stack or from your stack? Uh, I got one here. This is a quickie. Okay. Uh, please explain uh, the passage about Enoch being swept up. And thank you, by the way, for the internet. Uh, please explain the passage about Enoch being swept up to the Lord, which seems to say Enoch never died. Interesting question. Over here, and uh, real quickly, uh, Genesis, that's uh, where this comes from, where you'll see a listing, Genesis chapter 5, of a listing of a bunch of people, and every time uh, it says, and he died, and he died, uh, you know, uh, Jared, he lived, and he died, verse uh, uh, 19 and 20. Uh, but now in Enoch, verse 21, chapter 5, book of Genesis, Enoch lived 60 and 5 years, begat Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. Okay, Enoch walked uh, with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not. <laughs> For God took him. Okay? He didn't die. It doesn't say he died. No. Everybody else says he died. All right. Now we understand, right, that we are mortal. Don't get shook. We've got to connect these dots. So let's go to Hebrews 11 and add a little light to it. Yeah, that's the, that's the one. We go to Hebrews 11. This is the faith chapter. And guess who's listed there? <laughs> Prophets, maybe? <laughs> Enoch, too. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so we go here to Hebrews 11, known as the faith chapter. Real quickly, we read uh, chap uh, verse 4 of chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch. Okay, here we go now. Mm -hmm. Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Aha! Whoa. What's this word translated? Resurrection? No. It just means he was carried away. Mm -hmm. It means he was transported. That's what it means. It means he was carried away. Okay, so don't begin. What, what's the word? Exegesis, Wayne, and, and the others? Eisegesis. Eisegesis. Don't read into. Don't read into it. Just read the scriptures for what they say. Translated. So he was moved that he should not see death and was not found because God carried him away. Enoch, like Elijah, was not found. Yes. He was just carried away. He was taken out of the, out of the mix, see, out, off the playing field. Why? We don't know that. I mean, you know, you could speculate, but that doesn't matter. What's important here is what happened to him. Is he still alive today, walking no. around the earth somewhere? No. And maybe no. uh, the Northwest or something? No. He goes on here, and it says, uh, <laughs> and was not found because God carried him away. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And then it goes on, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham. We even have in verse 11, through faith, Sarah herself received strength. On and on, verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and the multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> They're dead. Him. He's dead. Yes. Yeah. They all died. Yeah. Who all died? Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham. That's the context. They're all dead. Yeah. That's definitive proof. And if that's not enough, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3 at verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven. Boom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, no man and has Hebrews. ascended. Only the son of man who has come down from. That's what he said. Right. And just to finish this off real quick, just to finish it off, these all died. Who all died? 
Sarah, let me go backwards, Abraham, Noah, Enoch, and Abel, they all died not having received the promises, proving the translation was not a resurrection. And what's the other dot say? The other dot says, every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits after those after his, his coming. coming. Has Jesus Christ come back yet? No. So where's Enoch? He's, He's dead. dead. <laughs> He's dead. Yeah. He's dead. That's what your scripture says. Yeah. Connect the dots. Don't leave one scripture out. Don't pull it out of context. Connect the dots. Be continuous. There's a continuum. Every dot builds on another so you get the full picture and you don't get confused. Right. And so it says here, uh, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims and so forth and so on. Then it goes on real quickly here and lists a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, that's verses 17, 21, 22, reiterates a second time the same theme. Talks about Moses in verse 23. Goes down and talks about the harlot Rahab in verse 31. Even talks about Samson and David and the prophets who were sawn asunder and so forth and so on. And lists all these people. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Verse 37. They were tempted and slain by the sword. They wandered. They were like sh in sheepskins and goatskins. These were poor guys. They were out in the wilderness, man. They were beat up. They were persecuted. They were chased down like animals. These people were hated by mankind in so many ways. Satan, the devil, chased them like rats and, and, and vermin into tunnels and into, into uh, you know, caves and so on. Verse 39. All these, having obtained a good report, regardless, they obtained a good report, through faith received not the promise. Yeah. All includes Enoch. Yeah. They still are dead and buried. Nobody has received a promise just yet. Why? God, verse 40, let's close it up, having provided some better thing for us that they, apart from us, should not be made Perfect, yet. In other words, we're all coming to that reward at the time of Christ's return. These guys will be there because they got the good report. They made it. They're in. And so God, apart from us, is not giving promises out in a, in a, in a, a particular sequential mode. No, 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 no. They all start to be given out with Christ coming back, bringing his promises with him, Revelation 22. Right. And as we meet him in the air, we're going to see, oh, man, there's Moses. Oh, man, there's Elijah. Right. I mean, I mean, we may not be able to recognize him. Well, that guy looks old, you know. <laughs> who's, who's that guy, Wayne? I don't know, but he sure looks old. <laughs> But my point is, it's, this is going to be so Looks great, good brother. For his age. Yeah, it's going, to, it's going to be so great. You've got such a, you don't know how, what kind of destiny you have ahead of you that is going to just be eye-popping and jaw-dropping. I mean, it's just going to be amazing, just amazing. And uh, it's your destiny. It's your destiny to have. God's offering it to you. But old Enoch, uh, thank you for the question. He's dead, buried, and waiting for Jesus' return because he's got a good report. He's got a good report. One thing I was going to say, there's three instances of built-in redundancy in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 to show us that they're all dead. <laughs> in case there's any doubt, there's three opportunities to understand that they're all dead. Right. Okay. All right. This one's an interesting one. Um, what does it mean Israel was afflicted for 400 years and were only in captivity in Egypt for 200 years? Yeah. Yeah. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 40. Well, let's see. How much time do we have? <laughs> I, can, uh, I can summarize it this way. Okay, there are di many different viewpoints. Um, even Josephus talks about the 215 years that, uh, anyway, let me correct that, anywhere between 210 or 215 years that Israel is actually into slavery into Egypt. Okay. Um, and I was going to clarify this, and I lost my train of, train of thought here. Um, but you're right, 215, 225 two, to 430, Yeah, depending it, on where you start. It, it depends where you start the time. Mm -hmm. And it depends how far you really want to get into um, some of the genealogies mm -hmm. uh, of people and what, what point you start this reference of time in. Or when you start, when did, when did uh, Joseph do this or the other? But really, when you look at it, um, it includes the whole time period, some scholars believe, from the time of Israel and, and Canaan to the time that Moses received the law, that 430 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. 
And there does seem to be some, does anybody, let me read this to you. Let me ask a question, okay? In verse 40 of Exodus chapter 12, I want to see if anybody has anything different. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. Now, you have the King James Version, you have the, the uh, New King James Version, and some other versions or transliterations of the scriptures um, that are based on something called the Masoretic Texts, mm -hmm. okay? However, when you go back to the Greek Septuagint, okay, there's roughly a thousand year time span between the Greek Septuagint and the Masoretic Text. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any translation that says anything different than what I just read to you? Because older manuscripts will say something along the lines of this. Now the sojourn... I'm just curious. Yeah. 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 Anybody got an NIV, the not inspired yeah. version? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have an NIV, the not inspired version Bible translation? You do? Uh, John, uh, what is it? I'm just curious. What does it say for that scripture? Exodus 12, what was it, John? Uh, 12, verse 40. 40, verse 40. You got it? Hold on, man. I was using this one. I was just kind of curious what the NIV had to say on it. Oh, uh, it's been it. Uh, yeah, there might be one back there. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. There was. That's okay. That's okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Let me, yeah. let me just skip through this through time's sake. But the older uh, translations you, should get that are, you get that are based more on the <laughs> Greek Septuagint, more than that of the Masoretic text, will include this. It'll say something along the lines of this. Now, the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt and dwelt in Canaan... See what I mean? Mm -hmm. And Canaan was, was 430 years. <clears throat> that make sense? Possibly. Yeah. It's certainly a theory. Yeah. I mean, Josephus, uh, in his writings, I have, let me, let me quote you Josephus here, what Josephus says. Yeah, he says, pretty much what the King James Version says, about yeah. length. Flavius Josephus, a first century historian, says, they left Egypt 430 years after our forefather Abraham came into Canaan, but 215 years only after Jacob removed into Egypt. Well, you add it together, you get 430, you get 430 years. years. So yeah. it's absolutely one. There is no um, conflict here. Mm -hmm. right. It's just how, when do you start reckoning the time of the affliction yes. of Israel? And that's what's up for interpretation. That's what's left up to interpretation. Yeah. Uh, there, uh, to, to that point, uh, I made some notes on it as well in regards to uh, not 215, but 225. Uh, and, and the time in this case, uh, there's two, two ways of looking at it. In this first case, uh, the time begins when Isaac, Isaac yeah. Abraham's seed, went uh, into sojourning. And they make the, the, the big issue of sojourning. And that marks the commencement of the 430 years. And it ends with the, the uh, commandments being given uh, on Mount Sinai. Yeah. You know. yeah. So I, I think to your point, Tony, uh, it, it really depends on where you want to start the count uh, that determines where and how much, you know, uh, and how that plays out. Think, did we answer that one? Yeah, I, I think, think we so. did. Okay. Yeah. All right, two hours in. Two hours Nine in, guys. You guys let's, done? Let's see some people huh? yawning and stretching. <laughs> you worn out? <laughs> Sometimes it's harder to sit there than it is to sit up here and talk. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're good for another hour and a half. <laughs> so should we take a consensus on what, what do you guys want to do? You want to stay? You want to, you want to uh, convene? Someone out? offer a question or let's get out of here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's Miller time. It's Miller time. All right. <laughs> George has George, George. Oh, George, okay. Uh, ex, uh, Exodus. Oh, Acts. Oh, Acts. Acts. 18. The ESV said the same thing. The NASB said the same thing. 
Then the King James Version says that. Uh, never mind. No. Uh, what scripture is it? 18, 18, 21, 21. 18, 21. But he I can't speak to that. I can't, I can't either. I'm not uh, cold turkey like that. I'd have to look it up and study it. Greek, it doesn't have it. It doesn't say it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jerusalem would certainly fit in the context because that's where Paul wanted to keep the feast, right. and Jerusalem would supersede uh, pretty much any location, you know. But I can't speak uh, affirmatively to what you're, yeah. what you're asking there. Short answer uh, from me to you is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's the honest answer I could sure. give. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the word feast is heorte, and it does mean holy day. And Paul being a Pharisee and in his travels, he certainly would have wanted to go to Jerusalem. Yeah, that would have been his intent very clearly. Pardon me? Well, certainly if it had been a pilgrimage feast, absolutely, that's where he was yeah. headed to. Yeah. Right? yeah. But it's significant that the word feast here is Holy Day. It's, it's one of the annual Holy Days. Yeah. And, and, and he would have, uh, being a Jew, being a Pharisee of the Pharisees, even as a Christian, it would have been very, very important for Paul to be in Jerusalem for that event. Okay. Uh, one, uh, got another one here real quick. I think we can handle this one. Uh, this was a question of, uh, how about Acts 9, 7 and Acts 22, 9? They seem to contradict themselves. Oh, okay. Acts 9, 7 and Acts 22, 9. Uh, and basically the question is, is that um, the, um, on Acts 9 and verse 7, Acts 9, verse 7, it says, the men which journeyed uh, him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And uh, Acts 22, 9, 22, 9, says, And they were with him, saw indeed the light, and were afraid, but they heard not the voice. So in 9, they heard the voice, and then in 22, it says they didn't hear the voice. And it's an understanding, real simple understanding about hearing and understanding. The word, the Greek word is uh, ekuo, ekuo. Yeah. And it basically uh, is uh, translated, if you look at it this way, where uh, in verse 7 of chapter 9, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, uh, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And in 22, and in verse 7, um, 22, 7, 22, 9, 22, 9, and they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they understood not. Mm -hmm. So they did hear, but they didn't understand. That's right. right. Yeah, so okay. it's not a, it's not a, and the Greek word is used, a, 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 a kuo is used in both cases. It's yeah. used in both cases, and it does provide a spectrum of being applied in both hearing Literally a noise, eh, you know, an yeah. understanding. Yes. But that Greek word is very important. Yeah. But uh, I have a footnote that I wrote uh, some time ago uh, in regards to those two scriptures. I just read my simple uh, explanation that I wrote before I knew anything about a cool, okay? Uh, in Acts chapter 9, uh, he said, Who art 
thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That is uh, uh, a Syriac Aramaic saying uh, that refers back actually to the prodding of animals to get them to do what you want them to do. And uh, the Lord was dealing with Paul, and uh, that's literally a reference to what Paul was experiencing uh, up to this moment, of course, culminating with this event. And then uh, he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. Mm -hmm. And I've got circled what I wrote here, hearing Paul speak, but not to whom he was speaking. Yes, okay. And that certainly would have been confusing for them. And then over in Acts chapter 22, uh, at verse 9, And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And my little footnote here was this. They heard Paul speaking, but not, did not see to whom he was speaking, nor did they hear the Lord's voice. Yeah. So I, I think that really comports cases. with what yeah. you said as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, in, in fact, the question boils down to the essential question of, of, of this. Is the Bible reliable? Um, because we have what appears to be a variation here. Uh, we do have an armor of God coming out soon on this very topic that we did a few months ago. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, a sermon... <laughs> Um, that I'll be doing in Medina next time I'm there to augment that, that armor of God that will go a longer way to addressing uh, the question that you have on that. But it's clear that the only seemingly um, irreconcilable thing here is the fact that they hear or did they not hear? They heard, but they didn't understand. That's the short answer. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, you just reminded me of something, too. There's, I, I did a sermon here recently uh, going back to Genesis 6. Just for clarification, I forgot to mention this real quick. But uh, there's a sermon uh, in our archives titled um, Women, Demons, and Sex. Uh, and it goes to Genesis <laughs> chapter 6. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6. And it goes through a much more detail of uh, that whole thing that we talked about some time ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just as a sidebar. All right, guys. We're pretty much out of we're, love. We're out of time. Yeah. yeah, we're out of time, guys. I'm sorry. We have we have a couple more questions that we like to get to, and uh, maybe we can address that in a future venue. But I think we, we probably should adjourn for the evening. Yeah. yeah. Did you like this format? Just curious. Did you like this format? Good. Good. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. coming, everybody. Yeah. Very much so. Drive careful. Be thanks safe. For your time. Yeah. A pleasure to serve you. Thank you. Yeah, I love that.